あえー、てるな、えー、えー、ちやきやないとか、はきのわいぐやてないか、みやつきやこえてたいな、あなるあるいこひまいてやのほまいひまいてのいてねてふななかる、まはきとたたべよ、あきたたたかとた。えいるのほきいてもひよへまわりてねえちわらいてるわまわりめにひかちがきてまなふにはなちとわらなちらあおてばあぬれたなおたらなききてゆくほてかあまわりてねえなちひねがぷひくわろわえのほわなえなきちあなえおくたまるがのらいれてまなふにはてねえかみひなちあきやこたうなちにかいちゃきおまたおまおあおてあわさぬいのまいはいれまいあとカレーにキャリアハウ、ヒコレルワーク、ノレカフタヒアチワハウ、ハウパパ。It's a real privilege to be invited to speak to you all today.、Um, I want to acknowledge first some of, your,、uh, some of the faces who are more familiar with me.、Uh, throughout the many, many years of Māori language learning、uh, that I've been privileged to experience here, based largely in Pornake. Um, but for those of you who, have not yet, who I've not yet met,、uh, it's a privilege. So thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. Um, uh, now, I, for those of you who don't know、uh, what I do, I'm based, as, as Lee mentioned, up at Victoria University.、Um, I work in the School of Māori Studies, and my area of specialty is Māori language and linguistics. So,、um, I am a, a fanatic of all things grammatical. I l- love it. <laughs> Spins my wheels.、Um, and I think it's perhaps that fascination with the minutiae that has also led to some work that I'm going to share with you today、um, in the space of literary translation. Now, these are some of my、um, most recent and, and current projects, actually. I've, As you can see, there's a bit of a、um, spectrum of <laughs> literary、uh, types. One of, my current project is,、uh, one of my current projects is working with、uh, a colleague of mine at Victoria University,、um, Simon p e r i s and he is a classicist、um, and、uh, well versed in ancient Greek. And so he and I are working together、um, in order to translate、uh, Homer's The Iliad. I thought it was much shorter <laughs> than I initially agreed to the c o p a p a than what it's turned out to be. And then he told me it was just the first book. <laughs> it serves me right for not having done classics myself in high school.、Um, the beautiful woman in the centre of that we shot is Catherine Mansfield, and I was privileged to be entrusted with、um, the first of Mansfield's stories to find its Barney voice. Uh, that was launched in October last year, celebrating、um, a whole bunch of things, including what would have been Catherine Mansfield's 130th birthday. But、uh, The Doll's House,、um, which is a story with, that many of us are familiar with,、um, having read it at high school, perhaps under duress.、Um, so,、uh, yeah, I was, I was tasked with, with translating that. That was a piece of work, and the Mansfield Society、um, had, we've just begun discussing a kaupapa. Which will involve、uh, a whole bunch of the,、well, the collection of her New Zealand stories、uh, being translated、uh, into Te Reo as well in the next two years.、Um, is anybody familiar with the third wee black and white sort of face the, at the top of that wee slide? Cole?、Um, that's Guillaume Apollinaire. So he's a poet、um, of French origin. Um, I did a bit of work, of course, Guillaume. <laughs> 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 oh, bro, a polymer. <laughs> so,、um, uh, a, a widely celebrated、uh, poet who、um, is only related to me in that he wrote this、um, Un chant, chant d'honneur, a, a, a song of honour, a song of remembrance. And it was an excerpt. Of the c a l i g r a m a collection of poetry which was inscribed in bronze and installed in the Pukeahu Memorial Park as part of the、uh, memorial to a, a gift from the Embassy of France and from the people of France. And so that was、um, unveiled last year as well. So, as you can see, when it comes to dealing with some of the big hitters, I think, in the literary fabric of Aotearoa,、um, we can see that we've got a diverse. Range of 
eras from which this work is derived, and um, also a diverse range of languages of origin. I think um, the piece of work that I'm excited about, um, what makes working on the Iliad exciting for me is that in honouring first the ancient Greek text and the Māori desired endpoint for the act of translation, um, what Simon and I are able to do is we're just teasing out a methodology that allows us to mitigate the impact of English as an intermediary. And so we're really working to uh, do as much as we can to honour both the true language of origin of that particular, of that, of that very important text and the true language destination point, presuming of course that all conversations with Māori don't necessarily need to happen through the medium of English. Um, that was what was similar actually with the work with the Polynia, and which, uh, that's what started off the Iliad project as well. And um, doing a bit of French, um, it was great to be able to be presented with an English translation of that piece of poetry, but to be able to refer instead to its original text and have an opportunity to reflect on the exact nature of some of the taonga within the original piece that we were trying to take care of through uh, the act of translation. Now, as Lee mentioned, I was a mama, uh, first and foremost. Um, actually, and so you can see the highly sophisticated, most recent additions to my uh, <laughs> translation portfolio. One of this were uh, one of these was a, a commission, Parawita. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar. How many of you are still delving in children's literature? You know Puba. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Gecko Press, actually, a local um, publisher, um, they brought Puba from French into English, um, where it was. Um, Welcome with open arms, as are so many young childhood things to do with poos and wees. And so um, Pooban was then translated um, into Māori. They approached me and, and asked if I would consider translating that. He Wahi Te Puruma, which was published by Huya um, back in 2015, I think, really was just an accident. I was down at Huya Publishers discussing with them the prospect of um, a, a grammar. Uh, that I'm writing, I told you. <laughs> Prepositions and all things syntactic, just spin my wheels. And so as I was discussing that project, I noticed in the uh, cabinet next to them that they had some of the, the, the gorgeous uh, translations of children's literature that I've leaned on as a mama who's desperate to speak as much Māori as possible uh, with my son. And bedtime stories is just one of these precious moments. And so. I saw Te Tāngaru Hau and I'm a huge fan of Julia Donaldson's work and my son is a huge fan of her works um, in English. And so I would um, kind of worry that in allowing my son free choice of the books that we read when we're at home, which is a very important principle in our house, I was worried that he was so often leaving leaning for books that were written in English. And some of the things that captured his attention were things like rhyme. And uh, that's one thing that Julia Donaldson does exceedingly well. Now, he was a huge fan of um, Room on the Broom. Disappointingly, he still likes it better in English than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I console myself that at least there may be some Mali children who do prioritise their way. <laughs> um, but this version of the story um, really was just a result of me being desperate to find more Māori speaking minutes in my day, being the only Māori speaker in my family, um, aside from my son, of course. And so, He Wahi Te Pruma, Room on the Broom, was translated line by line, really. I'd just, I'd read in the book, I'd lie there before he would let me leave. As a prisoner of the bed, as so often happens with little children who are not yet ready to go to sleep on their own. I would sit there and think, how could I do that? So Wahi Te Pruma was born and out of a conversation with um, Huya Publishers where I said, when are you going to do something, some, some other Julia Donaldson work? They said, well, we've given it a go, but that, that rhyme is, is, is really tricky. I said, wait, well, I've translated it at home <laughs> just to read with my son. Would you publish it? And it is a mark of the great love that Huya Publishers has for the deal and the community that it serves 
that it was willing to put itself on the line and put that book out there just because they knew it was there to be read. Over Places You'll Go is another labour of love. So my son just turned five and I loved this book. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the story, Over Places You'll Go, Dr Seuss? And so um, I was a huge fan of this story um, growing up. I think I must have bought about 25 copies as 21st presents. Any of my students who are not yet turned 21, brace yourself. There'll be a couple of copy coming your way. Um, and in this sort of uh, moment of reflecting on my son, who just went from grub to, well, he's still grub, to be honest, but a five year old grub, um, it made me think, oh, I really, it feels like a coming of age. And so, as his fifth birthday present, I decided to translate that story uh, for him. Now, whether or not that makes it to print, remains to be seen, but the point that I wanted to make here is that some translation in my experience is done out of an act of commission, some is just out of an act of opportunism, and sometimes it's just an act of aloha. We really, what we're wanting to do is ensure that something beautiful can be shared in the medium of Te Reo Māori. Next slide please, Ray. Um, However, while I was, I had every intention of speaking to you only about literary translations, in the past week, a wee something popped up on News Talk ZB, uh, Talkback Radio, and I thought it would be remiss of me for us not to tackle this cope up and have a wee chat about it. So if I, if I have a look at this uh, presentation today as reflections on the lessons learned from leaping from one language to another, it's certainly true that um, in the act of literary translation, I'm quite literally trying to recognise, I, I really see literary translation as an exercise in creative kaitiakitanga. Mm -hmm. So if we have a look at an original text, identify the taonga within it, and then work to ensure that those, that, that those taonga are um, protected and, and survive the leap between languages and cultures. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it occurred to me, as I was thinking about how I felt about the wee altercation between Marcus Lush and his two listeners, and the backlash, I suppose, in the comment section on any of those um, media outlets that chose to publish this wee story, I thought, well, it's not only those who are well-versed in the old Māori, who are used to leaping between languages. I would argue that most of us are now, well, in fact, I would argue that any New Zealand English speaker is actually pretty adept at stepping into other systems of sounds, other languages, for certain words and jumping back into the fabric of English. Now, it's only perhaps been more recently that that's also been the ex expectation in our treatment of fighting words in mighty names, right? Do you guys know what I mean by that? What I mean by that is that in, like for example, um, uh, how many of you are, are, are aware of this wee altercation? Okay. Um, if you're not, uh, good job. <laughs> this has overtaken my um, news feed, but if, if you're wondering what the cheese has <laughs> to do with anything, although I would argue cheese goes anywhere. Um, so Marcus Lush basically, um, and correct me if I've, if I've misrepresented this week's situation. Uh, long story short, a uh, caller from Dunedin brings news talk, uh, uh, talkback radio, um, mentions Opaho, is corrected, takes great exception to being corrected. He says, no, it's Opaho, we call it Opaho, blah, 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 blah. So, um, and then, uh, that conversation finished and then another person called in support of the asserting the accuracy of anglicised pronunciations of Māori place names. Right. Now, um, Marcus Lush, to his, to his credit, although he looks actually a bit sinister in that way, <laughs> um, to his credit, he really kind of teased slash dragged this wee interaction out. Um, and the reason I mentioned the cheese there is there was this one moment that I think was more illuminating than any other. He said, but would you say camembert about the cheese? And the woman he was speaking to at the time said, of course not, Marcus. 
because I'd be educated. <laughs> now, I thought that this was really interesting because, now sure, there were all sorts of examples of overt racism which kind of littered, were littered throughout that particular interaction. But if we peel all of that away and just look at what's going on linguistically, it's fascinating that to say camembert is to indicate a lack of education or being uncultured and yet for a significant proportion of mainstream Aotearoa, even in 2019. Now I know of course that the South Dunedin isn't necessarily a bustling mighty <laughs> metropolis. <laughs> but 2019, we're still talking about whether or not um, Maori words and names are treated as we would treat any other status, words borrowed from another status language. In, in this example, we've got camembert, of course, when it comes to cheese, the French rain. Similarly, I suppose, with wine. If I was to offer you a glass of pine nut noya, you'd think, no, but no. <laughs> um, to, for me to misrepresent that word, even though it goes completely against the rules of English, the, the anglicised pronunciation would let me far, far away from the Pinot Noir that we expect from any discerning English speaker in 2019. We, yet we've imported sounds from a whole other language. Something which many of these people, these two callers include, uh, included, a certain never actually happens in English. This happens all of the time. However, English has this long legacy of borrowing words from other languages. But it does one of two things when we import words from another language into English. Either the sounds of the language of origin are retained, or we superimpose the system of sounds for English. Now it may not surprise you to hear that when a language, uh, when a, a, an original culture, original language is considered to be prestigious, then those sounds will be retained. And when it's not, they will not. Now I understand that for many people, we now, given the rapid evolution of the linguistic fabric of New Zealand society, we have people within the same workforce, within the same office, who have come from completely different schools of thought and have experienced an education system based, uh, underpinned by totally different attitudes towards te reo Māori. What we have is a large proportion of people who still believe that within New Zealand, within, oh, well, probably New Zealand, that the Māori language should have the system of English sounds superimposed upon it. And yet, I would argue that in 2019, our expectations of cultural competence to be cultured, to be educated and employed in most mainstream society in 2019, I argue that our expectation is that we recognise Māori language as being a status language within this country. Now there are all sorts of layers of status, legal status absolutely, um, it's uh, presence within our education system, for sure. The existence of things like Māori Language Week, absolutely. But um, this wee shift in attitudes has resulted in a massive spectrum of levels of Māori language experience, even by those who would all consider themselves adults in this moment in our history, right? So, I would argue that the accurate pronunciation of Māori words and names is one of those critical components of being culturally competent as a New Zealander in 2019. Now I know that that's not necessarily uncontroversial, but I would, like, I think the mere fact that you're sitting here and we're discussing things Māori language tell us, this is evidence of the fact that we are riding a wave of an increased appetite for te reo Māori, an increased interest in te reo Māori, the likes of which we possibly haven't seen since the arrival of the first settlers. And with that comes the shift. We're moving beyond the assimilation policies, which, which asserted that the only language that was supposed to be spoken on these shores was English. And we're gradually becoming aware 
that the English language will not perish if those languages which are so important to this land are allowed to actually be seen and used even in public domains. But I want to just quickly highlight some of these points. We've got attitudes of different eras, I've spoken to that already, and we've also got this historical lack of quality language education opportunities. So, so often, I do a lot of consulting with uh, government organisations and, um, in fact, not just government, not just government agencies, but large organisations from Trade Me to Treasury, Reserve Bank to Wakatu Incorporated. So, um, we, what's shared amongst all of these different organisations is without fail a, pr a professional development opportunity uh, to learn a little bit of Māori language. We'll have at least one person sitting in that room who says, we never learned anything in school. Ever. I grew up in, insert place here, in the castle. I grew up in Christchurch. Everybody goes, ah, oh, Christchurch. And so, <laughs> Um, it's really, it's so common for people to say, hey, no, that was never anything that I experienced. That wasn't part of the fabric of my educational experience. So, what both of these things lead to is the over-representation of mispronunciations of Māori words and names. It's only because these things are unfamiliar that they seem to be difficult. Now, because I've got you here for a little while, and I promise not to keep you too long, but I would argue um, that I could teach the fundamentals of accurate pronunciation of mighty words and names in 15 minutes max. So, um, start your clocks. Go! <laughs> uh, next one, please. Okay. I've got four simple rules when it comes to accurate pronunciation of any mighty word or name you encounter. Now I know that the tendency can be, when you're presented with a Māori word that you don't know, um, how many of you, honestly, how many of you actually struggle to pronounce some Māori words and names, you come across some and you think they're tricky? Nobody's going to put it in a room. Oh, wonderful, honest, rescue lies, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if we're having a look at this Māori word that you haven't yet encountered, and if we want to think, for example, of a word like um, a name like, like, like taupo, some people have grown up and thousands and thousands of times they've heard taupo and it becomes a really difficult habit to break. We've got thousands and thousands of bits of evidence stored away that tell us that the accurate pronunciation of that place name is taupo. Now, so we say, no, it's taupo. We go, right, okay, well I need to remember that. So they write down tow the boat and pour the wine. Taupo. Fantastic. What we introduce though, by relying on phonetic spellings, is all of the inconsistency of the hot mess of the system that is the English language. <laughs> to illustrate this, I want to show you, uh, right, so can you visualise, I didn't put it on my slides, just run with me here. Can you see um, the name Topo in your mind? Right, cool. And, and can you see T-O-W, To, and, and, and P-O-U-R? Awesome. Now, if I take the P out of topo and put in an H, what's it going to sound like? <laughs> if I take out the P out of topo and put in an H, what's it going to sound like if it's said properly? I should have said that. <laughs> to po. You with me? Right? Now, I want you to take out the P from po and put in an H, and what does it sound like now? Our, right? P O U R. Poor, swap the consonant, H-O-U-R, same vowels, totally same tail of the word, completely different sound. And so the phonetic spellings, in my opinion, are a false friend. They will help you out with that one instance, but cannot be relied upon if you change any element of the spelling of that word. So, Four easy rules for the accurate pronunciation of Māori words and names. Here we go. Number one, you must know and trust the Māori alphabet. Can you make sure that you're sitting with at least one person? You're going to be working in pairs. I want you to have a look across those wee, uh, four wee rows and tell me how each of those letters is pronounced. I've got a couple of key questions for you in just a minute. What's the difference between that, uh, the letter, what I call A in English, and the A that seems to be wearing a hat? What's the difference in pronunciation between those two? 
Um, what's the difference in the pronunciation between this letter, what we would call R in English, and what it sounds like in Māori? And how can two letters possibly be one letter? <laughs> well, so these are all of the letters of the Māori alphabet. And so you'll notice that there are a whole bunch of letters which are represented in the system of English, which have no place in the Māori language. Now this is useful because you know that if you see a word that's got a B in it, it's not a Māori word. <laughs> it's great. Um, now, while many people argue there are 15 letters of the Māori alphabet, I'd argue that there are 20. I argue that we've got a system of 10 vowels in Te Māori, the short ones and the long ones. Now, um, we could go on and on for ages as to why I think that's the case. You could just trust me, and I'll give you a couple of words as an example. Um, I know, for example, that the presence or absence of the macron can denote a significant shift in the meaning of a word. <laughs> One example which comes to mind is par, meaning dollars, right? One long vowel, one short vowel. So par, kia something I did not prepare earlier, as you <laughs> Um, what you may have noticed as we were having that wee discussion around the alphabet is that uh, the presence of this thing called a macron, this is more than just politically correct filigree. <laughs> this little diacritic lets us know not just how the word should be said, but also crucially in many instances what it means. Anybody know what para means? It means dollar. It's a good one to know. Yeah. Without the macron, how would you say it now? Oh, yeah, just one more time. Oh, Excellent. What does that mean? Vagina. <laughs> I'm leaving that on the board. <laughs> okay. How would you pronounce this one? Go. Yeah. Perfect. It means cake. Did you know that? Oh, some of you nod. Okay, I'm getting a sense of your vocabulary. <laughs> With macrons. Yeah. Perfect. Armpits. And here's one of my other favourite examples, being that we're sitting in Wellington and considering our cultural <laughs> heritage. One of these is a terrifying creature, and the other is a turd. <laughs> which is which? Which one's the bug? Wenta, exactly right. Wow. So, knowing this, <laughs> How many of you are keen to go to the Weta Cave? <laughs> <laughs> Struggle on the head for a Weta workshop. <laughs> or you can join me on the bus for a Weta tour. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes the absence or presence of a macron can denote a significant change in meaning. It's for that reason, and it's the main reason, in my opinion that I would argue that these are more than just little letters with hats on. Instead, they're whole other letters of the alphabet. They should be written and pronounced as such. Sometimes, you're just not keen on getting those confused. <laughs> so, uh, right, so the difference between the systems of vowels. Now, how would you pronounce that top row? Go for it. Awesome, that sounded great for me. And so for those of you who are confident in the pronunciation, that's brilliant. For those of you who weren't confident but were just mouthing it, good strategy, that's fine. Um, a, a little um, phrase which has been useful for my students in the past is, are there three or two? Are there three or two? Okay. Now I know with many of you, you're very confident in this pronunciation. These are really just hints that I have and that I offer to you for you to share with those around you who might still struggle in this space. Um, with the macrons, what are they going to sound like? I know it's all relative. Go. A, E, O, U. Watch the spread of the air sound I'm hearing. A. I want air. 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 Right. Um, cool. Okay. Now what we'll notice about the consonants, the great news is, firstly we've got fewer letters to deal with, to contend with, than what we have in English. Uh, no B, no C, no D, no, no F. And what's more, every single one of these sounds is represented somewhere in English. There is not one of these sounds that we do not produce in English words 
and names. So that should be a, um, reassuring for us, surely. In fact, if I was to put a letter A, right? And what I mean by A is what we would call A in English. The reason that that letter is called A in Māori is because that is the only sound that that letter ever makes. Okay? Beginning, middle, or end of the word, no exceptions. Now before I was just talking to you about the difference, the complexities in the system of English. Three letter A's in this word and they all sound different. Give it a go. Just adapt more in case any of you were going to struggle with saying that one out loud. Go. Right. Uh, eh, eh. Right? Three different letter A's, all of which sound different. Given that, we learn as expert speakers, readers and writers of English that when it comes to those vowels, we have some wiggle room. We can expect variety. It's perhaps then no wonder that someone might look at this with four A's in it and think, okay, let's change it up, matter, matter. Whereas instead if we recognise that the, we know and trust the alphabet of Te Reo Māori, we know that that's A and it's A every single time it appears. So that is instead what? Easy. Okay. Um, now, the only three consonants which can prove a little bit tricky for speakers of New Zealand English are these. R, as opposed to R. Now I want you to you know, get a little sense of the mouthfeel for those two sounds. Go R. Nice English one, go. Get it going, Moskiel. Let's go. <laughs> now I want you to tell me what part of your face you are using to produce that sound. Cheeks. Cheeks, eyebrows, go ahead. <laughs> it's fine. R. It's produced with your bottom lip. Can you feel it? R. 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 Try making a R sound without moving your bottom lip. <laughs> right. So it's all involving that articulation produced by the bottom lip of your mouth. So however, in Māori, the R in Te Reo Māori is nothing to do with your bottom lip. R in Te Reo Māori is produced by a tap of the tongue. Not tapping it like this, but the, this is my tongue by the way. <laughs> Not actual size. And so, um, this is my tongue in my mouth. Right. And I say R, R. What I'm doing is I've got the tip of my tongue tapping the bony ridge behind my top teeth. Can you feel it? Can you see that that's nothing to do with my bottom lip? So, letter R in English is R in Māori. A tap of the tongue, not the bottom lip. That's all you need to keep in mind. Tell me what's going on with these two, uh, well these four letters that are apparently two letters. What does this one sound like? No. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Now, uh, the NG sound has different uh, um, pronunciations in English. Consider, for example, the word English, where we go all the way to G. Can you hear it? English, English. I know I'm exaggerating that, but I don't go English, right? Um, but we do produce that NG sound in the middle of a word like singer, right? I don't go singer, unless I'm from Manchester, I learned through experience. Anyone from Manchester? Okay, well good, we're fine. So, <laughs> so singer, singer, go. Singer. Right, take off the C. Nga. Yeah, tangata. Awesome. Now the critical difference in the NG sound, because a lot of people will go, here yeah, let's just quickly go around the group, go nga. 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 No pressure, Molly. <laughs> Read, my student. Come on out. Yeah. Okay, cool. I have a cameraman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what I've heard is three different iterations, okay? I've heard three different pronunciations of that same letter, and we all thought we were saying the same thing, right? I heard some of you saying na, na, which sounded more like an NA to me. I heard some of you saying na which is awesome, you're the most in the room. <laughs> and some of you um, do like a, like a, a yes sound in the middle, like nya, <laughs> nya nya. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this sound, what are we talking about here? The NG sound in Maui, again, tongue's back, right? So I want you to try just the letter n, n, 
string it together with a bunch of ah, so I'm going to go na 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 na. I want you to say that for me, and I want you to think about which part of your tongue is doing what in order to produce that na na sound. Ready? Go! Na 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 na. Not just me, I'm excellent at it. Go! Doing? Which part of the tongue? Yeah, right, so the tip of the tongue is touching that, again, that body ridge. Na, 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 behind my top tip. Na, you can't go with mine. Na, 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 you feel it? Now, the NG sound is nothing to do with the tip of your tongue. Na, right? Nah. Now we know that. We know that there's a huge difference between singer and singer, right? But we're just not used to isolating it that way. The NG sound is produced in the middle of the tongue, which raises up towards the roof of the mouth. It's nothing to do with the tip of my tongue. To illustrate this point, I can tuck the tip of my tongue behind my bottom teeth, behind, not in front, it completely changes the sound. Like this. <laughs> nah. Go. Now I guarantee you, if you are mispronouncing the NG sound, it's because you're using the tip of your tongue, which has nothing to do with that space, right? Middle of the tongue, raise it up towards roof of your mouth. Nga. Go. Nga. Awesome. Now, uh, how is this one pronounced? Fa. Fa. Yeah, so standard pronunciation is fa. As I acknowledge, but I'm not fine with We know that one of those <coughs> features of that language is a slightly different treatment of um, the WH where we tend to elide the uh, H sound itself. It's interesting, in many instances people will say, well how do you know if it sounds like an F, or well, why not write an F? And that's an absolutely logical question. Pronounce this one for me. Please don't say quite free, please, or I will leave. Right, Paul Fetty, go. Paul Fetty. Awesome, okay. Now, <clears throat> what's clever about that WH is it does a great job of having a hitching post, like a hitching point, for the, the, the primary kind of dialectal variations, okay? For example, in the north, far north, we'd say Paul Hedy. Round Taranaki, Paul Wedi. Round the um, river, much to Michael Law's dismay, <laughs> we'll say poor fin with a slight aspiration, right? And most other places there are going to treat us as an F. Clever, is it not? Imagine if I spelt it like this and said poor witty. You know? Mm -hmm. like, oh, right, so that's a whiff. Of course it's a whiff. <laughs> it's perfect sense. So I think the way that the system or morphography into your body is a great friend for you, provided you remember its rules. Now, here's my next question. In the north, we call it a poor hitty. You're from here, where they call it a poor fitty. You go for a work trip up to the north, up north. What should you say? What's the culturally appropriate thing to say? So as not to cause offence. So as not to disrespect your hosts. <laughs> What's the culturally appropriate thing for you to call it? Is it a poor hitty or a poor fitty when you're up north if you usually say poor fitty? What do you think? I've, I've crippled you all with indecision. I normally call it a poor fitty anyways. Oh, right, okay. Okay, so, okay, well, what then if you went to uh, Taranaki? Oh, uh, I'd probably still go with poor fitty. Poor hitty, right? I agree with you. I think that that's really sensible. In many instances, I think, my experience of people learning a little bit of real Māori is that they, they do so out of a desire to demonstrate respect for the language of this country and for the people to whom that language belongs. And when demonstrating respect is your desire, of course the last thing you want to be doing is causing any offence. But I think some people overthink it. You know if I went down south, well I'm not likely to, not after Marcus and this. <laughs> If I went down south, say to Invercargill, I'm not all of a sudden going to call it purple. <laughs> Land in Invercargill, all of a sudden it's not purple anymore, it's purple. Why? Because I'm in Invercargill. Well, no. Um, 
If I've lived there for long enough, I get exposed to that, that becomes part of my everyday usage to which I'm very familiar, that's fine. But as a visitor, I'm not going to feel I need to put it on like an accent. Make sense? At the same time, being culturally competent, I'm going to go down to Invercargill and I'm not going to be shocked and amazed when someone says purple. I'm not going to presume that everybody there has some sort of speech impediment, right? And exactly the same applies to the situation in Te Mai. Standard pronunciation of the WH is fit. Therefore, take standard with you wherever you go. But be aware that we have regional variation when it comes to the pronunciation of that sound. And the other digraph as well. Okay, I promise the other slides aren't this long. Okay, rule number two, uh, half of which we've hidden. There we go. Um, rule, so rule number one is you've got to know and trust your Māori alphabet. Know what the letters sound like in your Māori and trust that they'll sound like that every time. Rule number two, you glide from one vowel to the next in te reo Māori. And e hoa mā, this is, such a, this is such a strong rule of the accurate pronunciation of Māori words and names that this even trumps the space between words. The only thing that trumps this rule of gliding from one vowel to the next isn't the word trumped, but like ruined? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only thing that, whatever's, this rule. Thank you. These herbs, I feel like those two go quite hand in hand. <laughs> anyway, um, is, the, is punctuation. Okay? Full stop, and you're not going to glide between them. Sure. Comma, not going to glide between them. Dash, not going to glide between them, that's fine. But a space between words you will, and you know that already. Because we know that we say kia ora, not kia ora, right? Unless, of course, we're Jennifer Love Hewitt trying to sell Facebook. <laughs> so we glide from one vowel to the next. We remember what the vowels sound like in Te Māori, and you glide from point A to point B. I'd like you to work with the person next to you, please. And I want you to start going down the columns. The reason I'm asking you to go down the columns is because it's very, very straightforward if you have the same start point each time, right? For example, the first pair that I've got in the top left hand corner is from A to A. What's it going to sound like if I glide from A to A? Go! Ah. Wonderful. Soothing, even. Um, <laughs> and exactly the same, it sounds exactly the same as the vowel of Macron. Right. What about the next one down? From A to E. Go! I. I. Right? Go! I. Awesome. From A to E. I. I. Can you hear how those two are quite similar? Why? Because the position of the mouth for E and E is quite similar. It's just that E is tightened up a bit. Have I? Uh, let's go down. We'll go down the first column together, please. And I'd just like to see those vowel combos. I'm going to give you the individual uh, vowel sounds first, so we're starting to train those in. And I'd like to give you the vowel blend. All right. Um, it's worth noting that that first column are actually the most frequent vowel pairs. Perhaps not surprising given that we start with the most neutral vowel. So the most frequent vowel pairs is that first column. Ready? Let's go. A to A. A to E. A to E. A O. A U. Kapai. E A. E E. E E E E O E O E U E R E R E E E You go E E O E U O A O E O E O O Nice U A U E U E U O U Terrifying stuff, is it not? A, couple, a little point that I want to point out for you because it's going to be important soon. Did you notice that when, when we go, um, glid, when we glide, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to teach you today, I'm not English. Right. Uh, when we glided from one vowel to the next, some of those um, vowel blends fit neatly together into a single syllable. Did you notice? Um, for example, this one. A, U, A, right? A. That sounds like one syllable to me. Would you agree? Yeah. Good. 
totally right. Right, we're going to look at the top um, of this middle column. E, A, go. Yeah. How many syllables? E, A. Sounds like two to me. Yeah. Try it with U, A, go. Whoa. Can you hear that? Like that? Yeah. So even when we're gliding between some vowels, some retain that syllabic break. Okay? Some are very easily, uh, easily spotted as one syllable, some are easily spotted as two syllables, and some kind of dwell in this weird area in between. But I want you just to note that, because we'll talk more about it in just a minute. Three? Okay, rule number three. You need to break up any mighty word or name you encounter into its units of sound. This is very important. I should have added at the beginning of this, actually, this is a totally different approach to the teaching of accurate pronunciation of final words and names. But this week's strategy I've developed out of my own language practice and my own teaching practice. It's worked for me, it's worked for mine, and so I'm sharing it with you, but it is weird. You break up a word into its units of sound. Now this is a little maths, if this is giving anybody mathematics kind of traumatic flashbacks, but please don't freak out, just see that the letter C means consonant, and the letter V means vowel, and what this little the formula tells us is that a unit of sound will always have one vowel in it, might have two vowels in it, and here's the crucial thing. If there's a consonant in the unit of sound, it's only ever going to appear at the beginning of the unit. Okay? And what that tells us, therefore, is that whenever I see a consonant in a Māori word or name, that's always the start of a new unit of sound. What I'd like you to do, please, have a look at these wee examples. And I'd like you to break up each of these words into the units of sound. Once again, these are units of sound, not units of meaning. But this is how you accurately pronounce these words. So, quick word to the person next to you, tell me how many pieces, for example, how many units of sound are there in that first word? Two. Just two. What are they? None. 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 Good. What are the next one? Kai, Tia, Ki, Ta, Na. Great. This one. Ma, Na, Su, Tao, Na. Nice. Tu, Ho, Kai, Ran, Ni, Ta, Ku, Ti, Ki, Ko, Ma, Ta. This honestly sounds like Mari speaking zombies at the end. Okay, ready? those little pieces fluently to string those beads together in a way that's going to seem like natural, less zombie pace. First word, go. Ma. Yeah, yeah, like, like less zombie. <laughs> Mana. 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 Conversational pace, go. Mana. Next one. Kaitia kitama. Kaitia nice. Next one. Nice. Next one. Mali ma? Pepe? Aho? Yep. Aho. Tu po kai la ni ha kuti i ko ma ta. Nice. Next one. Iru. Sorry, what the fuck? I'll tell you that I'm going to go over all the material. I'm going to go over all the material. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, next uh, slide, please, Ray. What about those ones? I've broken those words up into their parts, but these words are so commonly mispronounced. Give them a go. Mm -hmm. 
With your partner, go. Oh, now I see this so commonly mispronounced way. I don't want to. <laughs> Okay, let's do these parts together. Ready? First part, let's go. Ko. Ko. Ma. Ma. Tua. Tua. Faster. Ko. Nice. Uh, next one. Wai. Wai. A. A. Ta. Ta. We're going to glide between vowels, right? So, wai ya ta. Go. Wai mm -hmm. Next one. Ta. Ta. Ki. Yep, natural speed. Ta. Ki. Again? Not true, not true. Mother too. 
Not true. So what I did find, though, is that if we're well um, established in breaking up a word into its units of sound, you can grade the units of sound within a word to figure out which part of the word might be stressed. Okay? So stress in Te Māori follows vowel weight. It's not always second to last, it's not always the first. Instead, it's the part or parts of the word which carry the most vowel weight. Now, I've proposed this wee hierarchy. It's got three different levels. One, uh, what it basic, all I want you to realise, I've just called them three, two, one, for no other reason than three is more, weighs more than one thing does, right? So three units um, is a vowel with a macron or two of the same vowel. Which vowel it is doesn't matter. So a unit of sound that has a vowel with a macron or two of the same vowel is going to be graded a three. Now here, what do you suppose is going, because I've got two vowels here, and two vowels here, what's the difference? Right, two vowels, one syllable, they combine their weight and they get a little bit heavy. Okay? Two vowels, two syllables, effectively act just like an individual vowel. Okay? So, um, Ray, can you go back a, oh no, go forward a screen please? Cool. So let's figure out now, oh hang on, I'll just, how would you grade each of these parts? Go. Okay. Yeah, how would you grade it? One, two, or three? Oh, Can you go back and screen ring? One, two, or three? It's just one vowel, right? Whether or not it's a consonant there doesn't matter. Go. This one? Okay, they're all even. Which part am I stressing? Yeah. When they're even, lean forward. Part Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, next screen, please, Ray. You realise you're making us count here, that's quite hard. I know, I know, I'm not to what the... I told you that your mind is a honor us language, yeah. So, um, what about these two? We've got a one and a one, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, cool. And so, which part are we stressing? The mouth or the na? Uh, you got to go. Uh, mana, faster, go. Mana. Natural pace, that's good. I don't want you guys all emerging and then Marty's speaking for me. Um, what about the, how would you grade the next three pieces? Go. One, one, three. One, one, three, right? Instead of going to stress the last part, go. One, two, nice. Um, one, 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 follow me? So which part am I stressing? Ha, go. Yeah, don't drag it, punch it. <laughs> Very violent. <laughs> I don't want you to drag it out, I want you to punch the beat. Do you get what I'm saying? I don't want you to go tamariki, I want you to go tamariki. Got it? Okay, so go. Perfect, that's great. Next one. Yeah, two, one, one. Lean forward, go. Nice. What's going on with this one? Two, three. Right, a little bit of stress, a lot of stress, no stress, go. Komatua. Can you hear it? Komatua. Uh, what about we see saw that we have three, a one, and then a three? Go. Okay, okay cool, just natural speech. Go. Awesome. Can you hear the stress see saw? Da 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 da. Okay. Uh, next one. Three, one, one. Uh-huh. And how would you say it? Yeah, awesome. So we remember, of course, that we're gliding between one, one vowel and the next. So we have ma, stress is here, ma, glide to all. Ma, ma. So try for me, ma, 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 ma. Nice. Um, what's the issue with panamu? Panamu. I've got this beautiful Panamu. What's going wrong there? Panamu. That's stressing the second to last syllable. And so where do we expect it instead? This is a two. Two. Pull. Pull. One syllable, right? Go. Two, one, one. Lean forward. Go. Awesome. Uh, next slide, please, Ray. That's it. Four rules for the accurate pronunciation of any Māori word or name you encounter. And this relies on just one thing. 
Oh, well, aside from your knowledge of the sweet system, it relies on you recognizing and being sure that your spelling is accurate. Now, that's not always the case. No doubt you've already heard some of the stories of the anglicized spellings about some of our local place names. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Points to a moment in our history where previously, when those anglicized spellings of our local suburbs in place names, in Mona, in rivers, when those anglicized spellings were acceptable, it was when they were serving the needs of an English-speaking population who had no idea about the system of sounds within your mind. In 2019, thank God, that's changed. We now have a population, <coughs> the vast majority of whom are attuned to and confident in dipping their toes into a system of sounds that has status here in Aotearoa. If they're not that familiar, you've now got four easy rules that can help those people on their way. When it comes to literary translation, I've rabbited on, rabbited on, she says, well, <laughs> um, spoken for a little bit about some of these projects, some of the key learnings that I've taken. If, you know, if we say dipping into the accurate pronunciation of other um, names, and I'm not, I just don't think that that respect should be afforded exclusively to Māori. It should be afforded certainly to Māori, especially in Aotearoa. But think of how many of our other colleagues become more weary and wary, I suppose, of anglicised pronunciations of their names. Just because we're not bothering to dip our toes into a system of sounds other than English. Delving, though, into literary translation and some of the principles that have underpinned this, as you can see, my most recent work has been driven by aroha, driven by academic freedom, like the freedom to be able to sit down for hours and, hours, 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 and translate the Iliad with the assistance of a classicist, a renowned um, uh, scholar of ancient Greek. And some of it's just born out of opportunity and a deep desire to ensure that beautiful stories are made available to speakers of the Māori who are hungry to read. The great thing about translations for a group like us is that when we know that something has been translated into Māori, we know that there's an English translation out there and ready. Some of the things that have been useful for my students in the past is to take some of these children's stories with well-established English translations and get a feel for how those words might sound. Get familiar with the terms of phrase. Some of those um, little learning opportunities are low pressure and are therefore that much more appetising, I suppose, for those who may experience a little bit of trepidation when it comes to delving and things that are Next slide, break. I'm just going to wrap it up now. I wanted to point out that in Aotearoa we have a history that's rich in translation. Um, in fact, some of the most contentious points in, our, in the fabric of our society have been based on translation. Think, for example, about the um, mission of the translation of the Holy Bible. Um, Let's think, for example, about the lessons we learned in um, the translation of the Tiriti of Waitangi from the Treaty of Waitangi and what that tells us about allowing adequate time for something to percolate and remembering the principles of, that, of quality translation which tell us we should neither add nor omit critical content from the original piece. But what it also tells us is beyond some of these founding documents, we also have things like Robinson Crusoe, Te Tamata Whaira Wa Ueneti, The Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare's work, Te Kaia Te Tohura, some of our own authors, like with uh, Ihi Maira's uh, The Whale Rider, and even Te Rautaka Te Tehi Kohine, um, The Diary of Anne Frank. There is a huge appetite for translations of the Reo Māori, and yet there is quite a chasm in between the eras of these two pieces um, 1945, I think, 54, something, 40s, 50s, Peter Hurin Rui Jones completed the translation of Te Tangata Whaira Wa Oweneti. 
Kaya ke tohura in the 90s, te rataka te te hikohine, just this year. Recently, we've had launched a, a project called the Kotahiro Puka Puka, um, an ambitious project which looks to, across the next 10 years, have 100 excellent pieces of literature translated by discerning translators with adequate uh, support for quality assurance. We're looking to create a canon of these translations to feed this hunger that New Zealanders, Māori and non-Māori alike, have rediscovered for um, te reo Māori, te reo ngamatire, te mei whenua. Now, if we think of this wee legacy and the sorts of posts, the pillars along this wee journey, we have the likes of Pākehā translators, including Kendall, um, the Three Williams, Reverend Henry Williams, William Williams, and Edward, Edward, Te Tama. Um, then, of course, we had this new era in the early 20th century with the emergence of the likes of Apirana Mata, Kini Tahiru, Kate Hurinui Jones, and Rewe Te Kohere. Some amazing work there, some of which, of course, were official documents, but much of which um, includes kind of passion projects. Kohere, for example, loved to um, exercise his, his muscles that help him traverse that space between languages and cultures and tackling some of the writings of Pākehā intellects of the period. And then we have the likes of Te Haumihi Ata Mason, uh, Sir Timothy Karetu, Katerina Mataira. Some of their translations have formed some of the most important pieces of, of literature that we have available on Māori bookshelves today. What might happen with Pūtahiro Puka Puka is really exciting. The first collection of stories, um, which have been confirmed in the first tranche at least, is um, Harry Potter, um, Avengers and X-Men. Paula Morris' Ramatira, um, Te Puea, um, The Alchemist, a whole bunch of stories. We have a cohort of licensed, um, skilled, very experienced Māori language translators working to bring these stories to life through the medium of Te Reo Māori. While for many years and many generations people have poo-pooed uh, translation as being merely a tool for colonial oppression, my point, my argument, is that if it was such an effective tool for colonial oppression, what it's demonstrated is its effectiveness and therefore this tool of translation can equally be used as a means to revitalise the language and reassert the mana of te reo Māori in Aotearoa today. Um, Read next slide. Some of the lessons that we've learned throughout this legacy are straightforward. Don't add things. Don't leave significant things out. When we rush, it risks the reliability, the validity of that final translation. What's more, some of the lessons we're learning is that a good speaker and a good translator may not necessarily go hand in hand, right? That this, uh, the craft of translation, mastering that craft, is uh, not something that comes naturally with a person's ability to speak a language. And um, that there are different approaches to translation. We can translate word for word. We can instead translate sense for sense. In my opinion, it's viewing literary translation as an act and expression of creative kaitiakitanga, recognising the taonga in an original text and working to ensure that they survive the leap between languages and cultures. It's part of that recognising the taonga and trying to ensure that those taonga are protected in the final translation that helps me to choose the techniques that one might employ when you're translating uh, anything from Homer to Mansfield, to Julia Donaldson, and a little wee story called Puma. I've taken heaps of your time, but I thank you all for it. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora tātou.